When, when Mo did invite me here, um, I was delighted to come, actually. Uh, first of all, this is a beautiful part of the country. And I was telling someone this morning that uh, I was in the break room and it smells like California here. <laughs> I mean, it just smells like California. I trained at Letterman. I w I've been out there for, I've been out here before. My wife is from Santa Rosa. So I love to come to Northern California. I think it's probably God's place on earth. So I was very happy to come. I'm also tremendously um, honored to be uh, the keynote speaker and really excited to talk to you about a topic that is very close to my heart, which is peripheral arterial disease. Peripheral arterial disease is something that uh, Mo and Dr. K and his group when they were, he was in uh, Louisiana, was with the group that was very tuned into peripheral arterial disease because in an atherosclerotic stroke belt like we have in the southeast, the best way to screen patients for primary prevention is, is with ankle brachial indices and documenting the presence of peripheral arterial disease. Because if you know they have peripheral arterial disease, you can assume that they have heart disease and cerebrovascular disease. And when people have peripheral arterial disease, as I'm going to show you today, they, they have increased mortality significantly over, this, over the population. But it's not dying from losing limbs. They die from heart attacks and strokes. So if you can identify someone who has peripheral arterial disease for whatever reason, who can walk, they still need to be very aggressively treated to save their life. And I'll show you some statistics uh, today that are, I think, a little bit uh, uh, frightening about PAD. I'm going to also talk to you in the next 45 minutes or so about <clears throat> what's exciting in this field. And I'm going to talk to you about some things that perhaps are inappropriately exciting in this field that uh, maybe have not met their expectation but uh, still have a lot of excitement and sexiness attached to them. <laughs> but before I do that, I got into my room last night at midnight? I don't know. It was late. And I walk into this room and I'm, I think I've gone into the wrong place. It looks like a 16-year-old girl's birthday party. <laughs> I mean, there were banners strung, there were crowns all over the place, there was food, there was dried fruit, there were nuts. I don't know what Dr. Khan's people think I do for a living, but... Well, the girls, uh, the, you know, Dr. White is the king of cardiology, so they had these king crowns all over the place saying, welcome to the king of cardiology. Yeah. Well, you can see I, I've taken pictures that I'm going to return to my office staff. <laughs> because there's some things they can learn about how to treat a doctor. <laughs> I do not have any financial disclosures uh, relative to this topic, but I do have intellectual conflicts that I think are important. Um, actually, I know it's funny. I'm interventionalist talking about intellectual conflicts. That's really, that's not true. My tr truly interventional physicians like we have here that are going to speak to you this morning will laugh at interventionalists saying they're cognitive. But I am a member of the Guidelines Task Force, so I do have some incentive in supporting those guidelines. And I am a past president of an interventional society, so I'm sort of a doer, not a watcher. I, I you know, given half a chance, I'll do it. And, and I think it's better to make errors of, om errors of commission than errors of omission. And it just, uh, it's, my, it's an attitude, and so just take, keep that in mind as we talk today. I mentioned to you that, that PAD doesn't live in a silo by itself. It's a Venn diagram with a lot of overlap. And so patients with claudication or other problems in their legs or just simply an abnormal ankle brachial index are people who are much more likely to have coronary disease or cerebrovascular disease. Vice versa, patients who come in with heart attacks have leg disease, patients with strokes have heart disease. These are all intertwined. The blood vessels of the body are systemically affected by atherosclerosis. They don't actually know they live in your heart or your leg or your brain. They simply get involved with atherosclerosis. So when we treat one, we treat them all. And it's important that we keep that sort of generality in mind because if there is a fault in cardiology in the last generation is that there's been a real focus on the heart. And we've done great work. I mean, there's no question that CCU mortality from heart attacks has significantly been reduced. Stents are tremendously effective tools for percutaneously revascularizing coronary arteries. We've done great work, but we tend to focus on the heart. It reminds me of a story when I was at Letterman as a resident. <clears throat> this is when it, we still had to dodge dinosaurs on the way to work. Um, 
but I was in a cardiology clinic and around across the hall was the vascular surgery clinic. And I would have patients who would come in and we were just then doing rehab. We were just then after heart attacks getting people up and get, getting them to move and walk. And I had a patient who said, I can't walk. When I walk, my leg cramps. And I said, well, you might have bad circulation to your leg. Why don't you go see the surgeon across the hallway? I had no thought that that would be my responsibility to take care of that disease. And now here we are 40 years later, and it's clearly cardiologist's job to take care of that disease. You cannot ignore the responsibility we have for taking care of leg disease, renal disease, carotid disease, and heart disease. And that's something that when I talk about this topic, you'll see that I really do think we should own more of this turf because continuity of patient care is what we're all about. And any of you who touch patients understand that it's the long term. This, you'll see today, I'm going to talk about this being a marathon, not a sprint. Atherosclerosis is a disease we don't cure. It's a disease we manage. And the more I see my patients over 15 or 20 or 25 years, I am really an effective caregiver because I get to know them really well. It's not like just one time I take care of this, send them back to their primary care guy. We take care of this patient as an entire patient for a long, long time. So continuity of care is critical, and that's what cardiologists do well. When we talk about the incidence of this disease, notice how steep this curve is as the patients get older. And guess what's happening to our population? Our population is aging significantly. I don't know if you've ever stood back lately and looked at a 75 or 80 year old person and thought, you know, this reminds me of a 65 year old person 25 or 30 years ago. People are really healthy. People are active. People are staying more functional. I mean, a 75 or 80 year old person is perfectly independently living, perhaps working still. So I think we have to readjust our, our strategies about how we care for folks. And as they get older, they're going to start to run into some of these atherosclerotic problems, which increase in prevalence with time. We're going to focus today on lower extremity, peripheral arterial disease. But peripheral arterial disease essentially is everything that doesn't involve the heart and the lungs. So any circulation, be it venous or arterial, would typically fall into this category. One of the things I'm going to leave here today with is that you 250 people, or how many we have here, are going to be able to do a goddamn ABI. <laughs> <clears throat> so that's it. That's the goal for the morning, and we're going to start right now. So there's some peccadilloes about ABIs. There's some conventions that have been adopted that are not necessarily the way you would have invented an ABI. The first thing is, is you only use the highest pressures. And that's kind of counterintuitive if you're trying to assess the severity of disease. So if you really want to know how bad the circulation is to my right leg, you'd take the lowest blood pressure, right? But that's not the convention of an ABI. The ABI says I'll take the highest arm pressure, whichever arm it is, the highest systolic pressure, and I will take the highest leg pressure, dorsalis pedis or posterior tibial, whichever it is, the highest systolic leg pressure, and I will take that ratio, and that's my ABI. So it kind of inflates the number. It kind of makes it higher than it would be in its worst case scenario. But it's what most of us who are casually engaged in ABIs don't understand, and so you get it wrong all the time because you take the low pressure. So <clears throat> there's a couple of definitions of peripheral arterial disease. So there are three states. There's chronic stable limb ischemia. These are analogous to coronary disease with, with um, stable angina, unstable angina, and, and ACS with STEMI. So there's stable limb ischemia which is claudication, which is pain or cramping of a muscle group, distal to an obstruction. There's atypical claudication, which is a patient who says, I can't walk from here to there because my legs get tired or my legs get heavy. They, they can't describe the cramping, but they can't walk. And it's not a joint problem. It's not a knee or a hip problem. It's a muscle fatigue. It's a stiffness, soreness, weakness. And that is va often vascular. And then, of course, the vast majority of patients with peripheral arterial disease, more than 90 percent, are asymptomatic. They do not complain. They can walk as much as they like. And then there's the critical limb ischemia group. These are chronic critical limb ischemics, and these are folks who are at risk of losing their limb. The people with stable disease aren't going to lose anything. They're not going to get an amputation. They're not going to lose limb. They just are functionally impaired. But this group they're going to lose tissue. They can lose a toe, they can lose a forefoot, they can lose part of their leg, and they present typically with rest pain, a non-healing ischemic ulcer, 
or unfortunately gangrene. And then the third group that we're not going to talk about today <coughs> is analogous to STEMIs, and that is acute limb ischemia. These are people that come in with, as I've shown on the bottom right there, the five Ps, pain, pallor, polar for cold, paralysis, paresthesias, and pulses. Acute limb ischemia. They have acute clot in their leg. The leg turns white. It's pale. And they're going to lose their leg in three hours if you don't do something about it. So it's the STEMI of the peripheral world. And then the critical limb ischemics are the, are the ACS of the, of the peripheral world and the, and the claudicants you can think of as the stable angina patients of the peripheral world. So let's go through calculating an ABI. So here's a stick man with arm blood pressures and leg blood pressures that I'm showing you. And so as you start to think about what we're going to do, which of these arms would you pick for the arm blood pressure that's going to become the denominator, the right or the left? The right. So the, <clears throat> the right is correct. And so then as you look at the right leg, which of those blood pressures are you going to pick for the systolic blood pressure? The dorsalis pedis or the posterior tibial? Dorsalis pedis because it's highest. It's counterintuitive, but it's the highest one. And on the left side, and, th and that ratio becomes 0.66. So it's, it's 100 over 150. And then on the left side, you pick the PT because, the, again, the systolic pressure is higher than the dorsalis pedis, and that ratio is 0.5. So this gentleman's AB, uh, ABI is 0 0.6 and 0 0.5. The normal ABI is 0.9. So anything less than 0.9 is primary evidence of atherosclerosis. <clears throat> there are very, very few false positives. They exist, but they're few. This is a good, good test to establish the presence of atherosclerosis. When someone has an abnormal ABI and they can walk a mile, they still have atherosclerosis. It becomes secondary prevention, not primary prevention. So it means you really aggressively treat these patients with statins to get their LDLs as low as possible. These are people who you really talk to about not smoking. These are people you talk to about good A1C control. This is where you focus your effort, is these folks who you know have atherosclerosis but yet are not having end organ damage. <clears throat> One of the things to think about is the magnitude of the serious injury or death that happens to PAD patients. and over. <clears throat> a short period of time, four or five years, you can expect 20 to 25 percent of these patients not to be there anymore. Now the reason they're not there isn't because they lost their leg, it's because they had a stroke or they, or they had a heart attack, but it's important that we help them. And so how do we help them? We control their blood pressure. We get lipid control with statins. We have them on an antiplatelet therapy with aspirin. They are actively walking. We want them to be as active as possible. We control their weight and we really focus on getting them quitting to smoke. Now those of you who work in an outpatient setting with patients like this, you realize this is heavy lifting. This is hard work. Most people don't want to do these things, particularly when they feel good. They have no reason to be worried about what's going to happen to them, so they require a lot of coaching. So I just wanted to give you an example of how willing your patients are to listen to your advice. <coughs> these are survival rates from plane crashes, and so you can see the best place to be in a plane crash is the tail. But that isn't exactly where your patients fight to sit, right? They'll sit anywhere but the tail. You can tell them this all day long, but that plane crash isn't going to happen to them. And it's the same thing with medical treatment of, of atherosclerosis. You can tell them to do these things, but they're not the ones who are going to have the heart attack. They feel good. So it really requires a salesman's job. It really requires participatory coaching from your point of view to move these folks into action and to get the family, to get the, the wife, to get the sons, to get the daughters. These are people who can do these things together and you can make a big difference in their lives by convincing them to not sit in first class. <laughs> so we're going to do some, some questions. So I'm going to show you the data to support this, but I want to I tickle your, your uh, interest first. So I want to know of these four questions. Uh, we're going to go through them one at a time, whether they're true or false. So the first one is, an unsupervised exercise program is beneficial for limiting claudication. This is when you see the patient in your office and you say, I want you to walk 30 minutes a day, five days a week, and you send them out to follow that instruction. Does that work? That does not work. That is a waste of your breath. <laughs> How about B? 
supervised exercise, whether we're doing physical therapy or rehab, cardiac rehab, is reimbursed by third-party payers in Medicare because they understand how important this is to the well-being of your population. Oh, hmm. They don't pay for this. <clears throat> how about C? There are no drugs, no pharmaceuticals, that significantly increase walking distance in patients who have claudication. Is that true or false? That's false. So there's a drug called solostazole, which actually has some magical properties. It reduces restenosis a little bit. But this is a drug that I'll show you the evidence has actually increased walking distance. It's underutilized. It's a wonderful bowel uh, loosener. <laughs> really, works good for that. <clears throat> and then D, which is conservative therapy is much less expensive and nearly as effective. I'm going to show you evidence that says, I'm a plumber. I love opening arteries. Open arteries are better than closed arteries. Amen. <laughs> but, but, good exercise, risk factor reduction, gets you really close. And it's very inexpensive. And so then you can stratify and target people who will benefit the most from an intervention. So this is the, this is the uh, pharmacologic therapy. You can see solostazole, 100 milligrams, two times a day. It's contraindicated in patients with an abnormal EF. If they have a low ejection fraction, it's a black box warning uh, for this drug. But other than that, it works really very well, but it does cause some headache and some uh, bowel problems. The rest of these medications, pentoxifylene, arginine, the, the rest, these are equivalent to uh, tobacco smoke enemas. Now. <laughs> If you haven't had an opportunity to prescribe a tobacco smoke enema lately, this is a spa. I'll bet you they have them here. <laughs> this is an experience to try, and it works about the same as, as pentoxifylene for claudication. So <clears throat> here's what exercise training does. Now, this is supervised exercise, dramatically increasing the ability to walk. There's, you cannot imagine having a coach, having peers, having folks at rehab work with p patients to get them to walk on an organized schedule really is effective for building up uh, collaterals and helping people walk. And this is the drug studies that show that uh, solostazole really statistically significantly different than placebo, but pentoxifylene is almost overlaid on, on placebo. So solostazole works, but really nothing else does. There's no plan B if they can't take solostazole. They require a lot of coaching to get through the first couple of days and weeks of solostazole. Typically it will settle down, the bowels will settle down, the headache gets better, but they got to stick with you for a couple of days. If they bail on you right away, you'll never get them back on the drug. I want to talk about a randomized controlled trial. There are a few of them in the peripheral arena. This is one called the CLEVER trial, which was to look at exercise therapy, medical therapy, and stenting for iliac disease, big artery disease in the iliacs. And again, the optical arm was solostazole by mouth and home exercise, not supervised, and risk factors that were managed by the local study site. And then the <coughs> supervised exercise group had 26 weeks of three times a week supervised exercise with trained uh, operators. And then the stenters stented everything they could get their hands on. Their job was to open these arteries to improve circulation as best they could. And this is the result. And the blue bar is the medical therapy group. The red bar is exercise with medical therapy. And the yellow bar is uh, stenting plus medical therapy. And what you can see is for peak walking time, meaning how long can you walk, the best group was the supervised exercise group. Now, both the supervised exercise group and stenting were better than medical therapy alone. If you look at claudication onset time, the COT, the, the stenting group was a little bit better than the uh, supervised exercise group, but not statistically significantly better. So again, very similar outcomes with exercise and endovascular intervention. If you look at the ankle brachial index, which looks at perfusion, how well was blood flowing, clearly stenting works. I mean, it brings more blood to your feet, and that works, but it doesn't seem to functionally uh, do a lot better than people who can be exercised. So it leads to the conclusion that you should reserve intervention, endovascular primarily, but occasionally surgery, for patients who really fail the ability to exercise and take solostazole. There's no reason to jump directly uh, to the intervention without having a good trial of conservative therapy. I wanted to, coming out here, Northern California, this is Dr. Charles' daughter. 
This wild man made a career in Portland, Oregon. He's just up the street. Um, and you can see he's on Life magazine, and does he look like a normal person to you? <laughs> <coughs> now this guy, apparently his family, everybody took covers of this magazine, saved him forever, thought this was grandpa. I mean, they're fine with this guy. I'm thinking this guy's a serial killer when he's not with <laughs> But he did do the first angioplasty in 1964. He did it with esophageal dilators, not with balloons. Balloons didn't come along until Grunzig in the late uh, uh, 70s. But he did these with esophageal dilators, and he actually took a claudicator with an SFA stenosis and significantly improved that gentleman with uh, angioplasty. So now I'm going to ask a, another question about claudication. Now, these are the stable patients. So <clears throat> which of the following is true? A limb salvage or avoiding amputation is very important to a claudicator. No. They're not at risk for limb loss. These are people who have functional disability. So they, you really can't argue, I'm going to open that limb and I'm going to save your toes. Their, their toes aren't going anywhere. So they're really at low risk for limb loss. What about the durability of patency? What about that? Is that very important to a claudicator? And the answer to that is yes. And the reason is, is that because they're functionally disabled, you have, what the treatment you give them has to be long lasting. It doesn't do any good to have to redo it every three months. So you really want to offer them something that's going to last and something that isn't going to hurt them in the long run. What about stints being more effective than balloons? Stints are better than balloons in the legs. You believe that? So the answer is sometimes and I'm going to show you when that is it's not every time it's not an absolute yes there are times when balloons do fine and D improving functionality walking distance is very important of course that's that's what we're treating in a claudicator we want their functional improvement we're not too worried about their legs staying attached and then E is the way we treat them is debulking important is it important that we take tissue out of the lumen so that we can open that lumen with either a laser or atherectomy. There are many different kinds of atherectomy these days. Is that helpful to treating a claudicator? And you know the answer is it's not. And the reason it's not is because while the procedure at the end of the day often is beautiful, the, the, it's, it's artery beautification, really looks much better than, than after a, a balloon is blown up, six months after that procedure, there's no difference. So it really isn't worthwhile to use that expensive technology to make the artery look pretty the day of the procedure because in six months it won't look any different than it did with a balloon. So when we talk about the indications for treatment, we're talking about lifestyle and occupational limiting symptoms that we're treating. We want to make sure these patients fail conservative therapy. Let me just tell you there's a tipping point coming in America where we're going to stop getting paid for the widgets we do and we're going to start getting paid for managing populations. We're going to start getting paid to take care of 1,000 patients or 100,000 patients as well as we can. And when we do that, we're going to want to spend money where it needs to be spent and that's going to be on the patients who fail conservative therapy and that should be reserved for them. We want to make sure they have anatomically suitable lesions, attractive for us to, to treat, and we want to make sure the risk of the intervention is low. So you don't, somebody who's creatinine is 2.8, probably isn't a good person to put 200 cc's of contrast to make an SFA open. That's probably not a good use of that because it will hurt his kidneys. Our goal is to improve functionality, not limb salvage, and, and to just keep in the back of your mind, whatever we do has to be durable and sustainable. The, you know, <clears throat> Overnight wonders are not what we're after here. These will not help these claudicators very much. A critical limb ischemic patient, as we'll talk about at the end, yes. So you get an artery open for a week, you heal an ulcer, fine. That's a win. Short term, but it gets the ulcer healed. But that's not what's happening in claudication. I want to show you some data, some contradictory data. This is a randomized trial from the New England Journal comparing stents to balloons in SFAs. And this is restenosis on that bar graph, and you can see that there is clearly a large benefit to patients who are treated with stenting for restenosis, out to a year. And actually, there are functional assessments that go along with this walking distance and, and ankle brachial index, and all of these follow with significant benefit. In this group, they proved in a randomized trial that stents were better than balloons. About a year later, another trial was published from Germany, same sort of patients, same sort of numbers, and they said, well, that's not true. There's really no difference between stents and balloons. So they kind of threw the field into a little bit of a tizzy because we thought we kind of had figured this out and now we don't. And the question is, why is that? 
So the Schillinger paper was the paper that said stents are better, and the Kronkenberg paper is the paper that said the balloons were just as good. What was the difference? Well, lesion length was different. The length of the lesion was twice as long in the Schillinger group that st said stents were better. If you looked at the incidence of stent restenosis, they weren't that different. They were pretty similar to, to both groups. But if you looked at the balloon angioplasty difference, you can see that balloons in the longer lesions in the, in the Schillinger paper were twice. So the teaching point here is that lesion length matters and that stents are really important in long lesions. They really give you benefit. But in focal discrete lesions, balloon angioplasty seems to work just as well as a stent. This is a paper that looked at seven years of outcomes for exercise versus stenting. And it's a busy slide, but there isn't any significance to anything in seven years. So at seven years, no matter what you did interventionally, it didn't do better than supervised exercise. So again, it makes it really hard in a claudicant to argue for stenting first as opposed to exercise. <clears throat> what about if you look at effective revascularization? And effective revascularization means that the ankle brachial index actually raises. Because a lot of times we'll treat patients and they have such bad diffuse disease that you really don't change the ABI very much. But if you get the ABI to increase by 0.15, that is a marker for benefit for patients. So if you want to know whether the stent you just put in is likely to have a difference for somebody's walking, measure their ABI that evening and you'll, you'll be able to tell. So clearly that's a predictor of benefit for these patients. And then the next question as this builds is, okay, so we've decided that supervised exercise is about as good as intervention. What about if we add intervention to supervised exercise? So if you take two groups of patients and you supervise their exercise, and one of those groups also gets revascularized with a stint, every single parameter gets better. So this is clearly the best way to treat patients, is to combine exercise, risk factor modification, and in the appropriate folks who can raise their ABIs by 0.15 to add intervention to this, and you'll return them to most functional uh, status. I want to talk about some innovative therapies. <laughs> it's going to talk about some new ways to uh, solve problems. So this is drug-eluting stents. So we struggle. Drug-eluting stents in the coronaries, we just accept and they've worked and no problem. But in the periphery, we have really struggled. Drug-eluting stents have not worked so well until the Zilver trial. And the Zilver trial was a drug-eluting stent that showed at two years, so su relatively sustained patency, marked improvement over the balloon angioplasty group. And that's the black dotted line and the red solid line. There are other groups in between that are sort of uh, uh, partial groups, but clearly if you have a lesion that you'd like to keep open for the longest period of time, right now today, a drug-eluting stent in the SFA is probably the best option for, for durability in that SFA. <clears throat> well, what about shamoplasty? <laughs> you know, don't overestimate the, the effect of placebo. I love placebo. Placebo is the reason I'm a great doctor. I, <laughs> you know, you do something to somebody and nobody wants that to work more than that patient, right? They want that to work. So you do something to them, you look them in the eye and you say, you're cured, get up and walk. <laughs> and they will for a couple of weeks, and then it comes back. But placebo's great in the short run. And so there's a lot of placebo treatment going on because we have such difficult ways to look at gauge peripheral angioplasty. So these are coverage stints. Now, covered stents may have a role. There may be specific niches. But if somebody says to you, should I be using all covered stents instead of bare metal stents? The answer is no. There's no benefit to covered stents as a primary treatment of choice. What about the cutting balloon? The cutting balloon is the best tool I have to get my cath lab manager's attention. It costs about four times as much as a, as a regular balloon. So when I'm mad at him, when he's not listening to me, <laughs> I say, by the way, let's have a cutting balloon. And he looks at his budget and says, what can I do for you, Dr. White? What can I do for you? Because there is no benefit to a cutting balloon. This data, the bar graphs on the bottom, this is the company's data. The company puts this on their website. The company says, by the way, this balloon doesn't work for anything. Want to buy it? And people do. <laughs> More than to just punish their cath lab manager. What about the laser? 
I love lasers. The laser's the cockroach of interventional cardiology. <laughs> you cannot kill this technology. <laughs> I have had a laser since the 70s. I mean, I was an early adopter of lasers. And let me tell you that one thing they do well is they are fabulous doorstops. They are so big and heavy. <laughs> you put that in front of a door you want to keep open, that goddamn door stays open. <laughs> $300,000 for a doorstop may be a bit expensive, but they don't work. There's nothing they do for you or for your patient that you can't get done a better and cheaper way. Atherectomy struggles. Again, we make the arteries look so pretty with atherectomy, but making them pretty today doesn't seem to help us in the long run. So atherectomy is a very expensive tool that doesn't seem to stand up in comparative trials. And then cryoplasty, this is great. So, you know, you, many of you will remember the days of the laser when we used the hot olive and we ran the laser up and down the arteries. And actually, most of us had in our, our mind the vision of a glazed donut, <laughs> right? Didn't it look, I mean, so you do this up and down the artery and in your mind you're thinking glazed donut, nice and smooth in the laser. When in fact, if you really looked at it with an angioscope, it looked like, it looked like ground beef. I mean, it really wasn't a glazed donut. Well then, so then they said, well, if heat doesn't work, well, let's freeze it, you know? I mean, that's a good idea. So they figured out a way to pump cold air into these balloons and freeze the arteries. And somehow they made up a story that said that that would help apoptosis. So, but because I can't understand apoptosis, there's no way I can understand how a cold balloon works. And of course, in the clinical trials, it doesn't. So give up on the cold balloon, that doesn't work pay a premium for the same result. So this makes me think that hiding in most of our cath labs is this guy <laughs> who said, I wish I was a catheter salesman because in cath labs there's a sucker born every second. Oh. If I bring them lunch once a week, they'll buy anything from me. <laughs> You're killing my vendor support. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mo, I didn't tell you that, sorry. <laughs> I, I should have mentioned that. So treatment of peripheral arterial disease is a marathon, not a sprint. Claudicators must fail conservative therapy before they get treated, and the temptation to use high-tech unproven technology should be resisted. Drives up the care, doesn't give you benefit. I agree with you that we, I conflict with some of my friends in the industry, but I tell you that it's expensive to run clinical trials. It's not cheap. And if they will sell you a device without spending a million dollars for a randomized trial, why would you spend a million dollars for a randomized trial? So there are no big randomized trials for atherectomy. And the reason there aren't is because we buy those devices without evidence. So all I'm doing is I'm actually not damning the technology, I'm driving them to prove it. I just need an evidence base. Show me that what you have works. And if you have something that doesn't work, then let's move on to new technology. Let's do something else. But unfortunately, they get stuck on the idea that they can keep selling it to us without providing any evidence. So we need to insist that they do that. And I'll be the first guy to use atherectomy the minute they show me that it's better than a plain old balloon angioplasty. All right, patient we're going to talk about. 63-year-old guy. He's coming to you because he has chest pain. You don't know any more about that than that. That's what the, the referrer says. But before you see him, you're going to tell your nurse to get some things, because you, when you see him, you want it to be a productive visit. So I want to know what you think would be an efficient thing to do before you actually sit down and talk to this guy with chest pain. So would you want him to get a stress test with imaging, like a stress echo or a stress nuclear, before you actually had a chance to talk to him? No, you don't. Too much money, too much time, and it may not be necessary. What about chemistry? What about his electrolytes, renal function, liver function, fasting, lipids? Would you like to have that before you sit down and talk to him? My answer is yes, because I think this is cheap and easy to do, and it may help you plan what you're going to do. If he has bad renal function, I may not be thinking angiography, things like that. How about an ankle brachial index? Are we going to do that before we see him? We definitely are going to do that before we see him, because it will establish the presence of atherosclerosis, and it gives credibility to his chest pain, particularly if it's atypical. If he's got atherosclerosis, I'm going to make, be much more serious about that. Am I going to do a coronary CTA? What about a non-invasive image here of this guy with chest pain? Too much radiation, too much cost. I don't even know he has CART disease yet, so that's too premature. What about an EKG? Yeah, I like EKGs. EKGs are cheap, and they give you a lot of ideas about whether there's been uh, problems going on in this guy's past. 
So he comes and he reports chest discomfort that isn't consistent with angina. It sounds a lot like acid reflux. He's sedentary, doesn't exercise, denies any limitations. His exam shows he's got hypertension with a blood pressure difference in his right and left arm. How many people here routinely measure blood pressure in both arms every time they see a patient? Good people. You got to do that shit. Otherwise, you'll never see left subclavian artery stenosis. And you haven't lived until the guy comes back with angina after his lima doesn't work, right? So you got to do that. Pulses are decreased on his right leg. Left leg, they're better. He has normal lights and normal renal function. His LDL is 145. His ABI is abnormal in the right leg. Uh, and with exercise, it drops significantly. What does that mean? What does it mean when ABIs drop a lot with exercise? It typically means proximal disease. It means aortic or iliac or proximal disease. And when they don't drop very much with exercise, it means more distal disease. So, so you just get a hint that this guy's got more proximal problems. It actually goes along with his exam, which shows that he's got diminished femoral pulses, uh, common femoral pulses. His EKG shows uh, LVH. So here's my assessment of this fella. He's got asymptomatic peripheral arterial disease. His lower extremity is involved right greater than left because of the ABI, but he's asymptomatic. He's got a left subclavian stenosis, his skin is asymptomatic, and he has uncontrolled lipids. With secondary prevention, he's going to need to be treated. Hypertension is poorly controlled. He has LVH as an end organ damage of that, and he has probably acid reflux disease, which I'm going to take care of for free because I'm really not a GI guy, doctor. <laughs> my plan is to give him baby aspirin, start statin at a therapeutic dose, not a baby dose. So he's going to get 80 milligrams of Lipitor. He's going to get 40 milligrams of Pravacol. He's going to get a, an, a therapeutic dose of a statin. We're not going to walk this guy up. We're going to treat him. And then I'm going to tell him he's got to start walking. He needs to walk. He needs to walk four or five days a week. Now, because I can't supervise him, I'm going to tell him to do it, but I, I feel obligated to tell him to do it. His hypertension is going to be treated with a diuretic and an ACE inhibitor. I'm going to tell him to be careful about his salt, and I'm going to give him an H2 blocker over the counter for his reflux. So he comes back a couple of weeks, and he reports his heartburn's cured. GI is so easy. <laughs> He's not been able to walk a block at a no Do you have GI doctors here today, by the way? <laughs> you, you didn't really tell me who not to offend. He's been unable to walk a block at a normal pace. He knows his legs feel heavy. He has to stop. He's on the medicines I gave him. His blood pressure now has been reduced, 145 highest on his right. And he has normal uh, function with an LDL that's now nicely responded with uh, a a LDL to 85. So I want to ask you what you will do now for this gentleman. So will you congratulate him on his efforts and tell him to see him, you'll see him back in six months, keep up the good work. Will you add Solastazole uh, twice a day and continue his walking and ask him to come back in a month? Will you perform a non-invasive angiogram of his legs to see what his anatomy looks like? Uh, will you offer him an invasive angiogram now and possible angioplasty because of his limiting symptoms? So the answer is you want to add Solastazole. He has not failed medical therapy. You're going to coach him a little bit about the diarrhea and the headache, and you're going to try to get him to take this drug for, uh, for a month. So here's the JNCA uh, criteria, and I want to know if you think his blood pressure is adequately controlled. This is a 63-year-old man, highest blood pressure is 145 over 88. He does not have diabetes and he does not have CKD. Does that meet the criteria for JNC8? Yes, it does. Patients greater than 60 years old without these comorbidities, goal blood pressure is now 150. So we have now achieved his goal therapy, very good. In patients who are younger, uh, without major comorbidities, we still are aiming at 140 over 90. And then first line and later treatments are limited to four classes of drug, thiazide type diuretics, calcium channel antagonists, ACE inhibitors, and ARBs. So a month later, he comes back. He's unable to take Zolosol because of diarrhea. What a sissy. He still can't walk a block at a normal pace, and he notices his legs feel heavy and he has to stop, and others haven't changed. So what do you do now? So congratulate him. Switch him to pentoxyphylline. Remember the smoke enema? <laughs> Perform a non-invasive angiogram to determine his anatomy or offer him an invasive angiogram with possible intervention if you find a culprit lesion. 
And at this point, I get feeling like it's time that this guy have a shot at getting better. And I can make him walk, and I can make him function, and I think this is a very reasonable thing to do at this time after having tried to do this the easy way. So again, the, ind the indications for endovascular intervention and claudication is lifestyle limiting symptoms that have failed conservative therapy. For medicines, that's really limited to solostazole at this time. He needs an anatomically suitable lesion. We don't know that yet. We're going to do an angiogram. We'll see. And then I want to make sure I consider risk to benefit and everything I know about him, renal function and other things, it looks like his risk to benefit will be good. My goal is to improve his function. He's not at risk for losing his limb. And I'm really thinking about how to make the most durable treatment I can for him. So, how many of you do a lot of radio cases? We should be doing more radio cases. I'm going to do this guy from the wrist. I hope I'm going to do this guy from the wrist because my biggest problem with, with my program is I have fellows, as we were talking this morning. So when my patients have a groin problem at 7 o'clock at night, they call they, the nurses in the hospital, will call the least competent person on the planet to see my patient. <laughs> and I'm saying that I think the bagger at the grocery store would be better <laughs> than a first year fellow because the bagger at the grocery store would be worried. <laughs> my first year fellow comes to see a patient who just had a blood pressure drop lower than 100 and sweaty and not feeling well, and he says, hmm. That looks like a vasovagal episode. Give him a little fluid and give him atropine and let's see if he gets better. And God damn, he does get better. <laughs> and the fellow says, see, I didn't have to bother my staff. I didn't have to bother my senior fellows. I've solved this problem. 10 o'clock at night, happens again. Fellow goes back and says, well, if it worked once, it'll work twice. <laughs> gives him a couple hundred cc's of fluid, gives him a little atropine. Everybody goes back to bed. I still don't know this is happening. No one's told me about this. It isn't until the third episode at 2 in the morning that finally I get a phone call. The patient now has acute kidney damage because he's been hypotensive three times. Going to spend a couple of days in the ICU, probably 10 days in the hospital, for a very simple thing like a retroperitoneal groin bleed that I should have been able to handle had I known about it at 6 p.m. So this happened to me. I'm an old guy. This happened to me a bunch. And I finally said, God damn it, that's got to stop. I'm going to use the wrist. And if I use the wrist and they call my fellow, it doesn't really matter what my fellow says because the wrist is fine. The wrist isn't going to bleed. So I can't get rid of the fellows, but I can get rid of my femoral access. <laughs> so I do everything I can through the wrist these days. I do about 90%. Dr. Khan mentioned I spent a couple of years in Europe in the 90s, and I, I learned how to do radials over there. And it's amazing. Almost everything can be done from the wrist. And this is why, because the bleeding risk is so much lower. There's really no other benefit, but it's the bleeding risk. So this is an aortogram. This guy's got a pigtail in his aorta from his right wrist, and you can see he's got a tight, tight external iliac stenosis. So anatomically discreet, very likely resulting in hypoperfusion to this guy's leg, and this is really treatable. This is something I can treat with a durable solution. Restenosis for this is going to be less than 5%, less than 10% with a nicely placed stent. And this is that final result. You can see that there's a stent placed. This guy's problems are fixed. It's, it's the perfect end to a story for a claudicator who is limited and has a lesion that's very suitable to endovascular therapy. I'm going to switch gears here for just a minute and talk to you about critical limb ischemia. And these are the people that stand to have the risk of losing their limbs. And it's really important that you keep this different in claudication. You want to treat these patients differently and you want to recognize them. So it's limb pain at rest or impending limb loss due to inadequate perfusion, distal tissue bed due to objectively proven PAD, they have rest pain, they have ulcers, non-healing, and gangrene. So this is just a survival curve. It shows you that not only do the IC, the intermittent claudication patients have increased mortality, but look how dramatic the CLI patients. Virtually no one is alive 10 years after the diagnosis of CLI. It's a horribly mortal disease and almost all of it from heart and stroke. And then what can you do for these patients? Well, you can get pain control. You can treat their cellulitis. You can start them on an anti-atherosclerotic regimen. There really isn't any other medical therapy that's going to help. You're not going to modify CLI with, with solostazole or any of the other medicines. It's an urgent but not an emergent revascularization opportunity. So these people that come in at 8 o'clock at night don't have to be treated like a STEMI. They don't have to go to the cath lab at 9, but they should go to the cath lab the next morning. They should go the next 
reasonably available time because they need to be reperfused. That's the only solution to their problem is more blood flow to that bed. You want to assess their comorbidities. You want to assess their anatomy. One of the key differences here is that you need straight line flow. So you have to, have, you have to be able to draw a line from their hip to their toe and show how the blood gets there. That's not true for Claudicates. The guy I just treated, he could have had femoral disease, he could have had tibial disease. I only opened up his inflow, his iliac, because that put a bunch of blood down that leg. That's fine for Claudicans, but not for CLI. It really won't heal their wounds. So you really are, if you're in for a nickel, you're in for a dollar here. You've got you to gotta finish all the way to the foot. Do not plan on inflow procedures. They won't solve your problem, typically. Durability does matter, but much less here than in claudication, because if you can get something open for a week, 10 days, enough blood to heal or start to heal that ulcer, you're way ahead of the game. If they reach the nose, we'll deal with that later, but you really want to heal this, threaten, this limb-threatening problem. This is a randomized trial from Brit Britain that compared balloon angioplasty to surgery. It's called uh, um, the Basel trial, and it showed that for patients who have such high risk of mortality, they're not expected to live two years, which many of these are, balloons are just as good as, uh, as surgery. So you want to do what we call an endovascular treatment first. You want to give endovascular a shot before you send these folks for open surgery. And then this is the olive registry. We see on the bottom left they risk stratify by BMI. Turns out, I love this, being skinny is bad. <laughs> <laughs> It's terrible to be skinny. Terrible. I have no risk of this, by the way. <laughs> but it's terrible to be skinny. It's bad to have heart failure, and it's bad to have your infected wound. And if you have none of those, you're a green bar. If you have two, one of them, you're blue. And, and if you have two or three, you're red. And you see how that stratifies, it makes a difference how much risk these patients have. <laughs> one of the thoughts I'd like to leave you with is we cut way too many limbs off in this country. Way too many limbs. Patients come with ulcers, diabetes, the black toe, the, you see the podiatrist, the podiatrist sends them to orthopedics, Mikey will do this, he cuts it off. They never look at the circulation. These limbs can be saved, and the functionality of some of these older folks really depends on having both feet attached. So it's really worth it to look. It's really worth it to have some form of vascular assessment on patients who are thinking they might need an amputation. We really need to change the culture of our primary care doctors, our, our, our podiatry cultures. We need people to think about saving these feet because many of them can be saved with endovascular therapies. This is just an example with a guy with gangrene. You can see he's got a bad pinch in the middle of a tibial artery. It fixes. It fixes, it heals. He loses that toe, but it heals because his forefoot has enough circulation. As opposed to a midfoot amputation or an, uh, an ankle amputation, this guy loses the toe. So again, it's important we think about how do we solve these problems. Below the knee stints, these are three randomized trials. They're relatively small, but they're three. They all show there's benefit for this. What about drug eluting balloons? You've heard about these. They're not quite available yet in the US, but they are in Europe. They look very promising. Again, randomized controlled trials, pretty good evidence, not like the atherectomy guys that won't compare anything, the drug eluting balloons, drug eluting stints, they do these trials. And this is one of them that shows it's very effective for restenosis. Don't have to put any metal below their calf. So you can just use a balloon that puts paclitaxel into the artery. Restenosis is dramatically improved. So we're really looking forward to having this technology probably within the next year available on our shelves. So I want to conclude today with the paradigm. It's been my life's work. Put the surgeons out of work. We'll operate for food. Now, now, listen, the funny part of this is someday this is going to be an interventionalist. <laughs> and some guy pushing a, a, you know, a, a cholesterol medicine is going to be standing up here saying, you don't need those guys anymore. Just take my pill and I'll fix you. Um, but that's it. Life changes. We're moving to a more endovascular world, more percutaneous world. We will replace surgery for most things. Uh, it's less invasive. The morbidity is lower. Patients strongly prefer it. And we now have evidence in many places that this is an effective and, and durable therapy. So I want to thank you very much for your attention. That was, that was a terrific overview. Uh, uh, Dr. White, any questions for Dr. White?
I figured I answered them all, but if you want to reinforce any, that's fine. Dr. White, is there any role for nicotinamide, as a, or is that bogus or an efficacious? So some of the vitamins are actually very important. Um, so for example, folate is a very important contributor to anti-atherosclerosis management. Um, whether other vitamins actually are going to be shown to be beneficial in, in excess, it's like CoQ10 and some of these other things. The problem is our diet is so rich uh, in these that it's really hard to show that over-supplementation doesn't just end up in the urine. So aside from, the only one I'm aware of is the 400 mics of folate. If you've got an elderly person who has a not a balanced diet, taking a one-a-day vitamin with 400, so it has 89 things in it. But the only thing that matters is 400 mics of folate um, in that one-a-day vitamin is an anti-atherosclerotic regimen. Is that to mess with homocysteine, or do you measure homocysteine? So you may measure homocysteine, and that's a subset of patients who have serious problems with their limbs, but it's not a routine screen, nor is, nor is um, for us, uh, uh, the um, high-sensitivity uh, um, uh, inflammatory markers. We don't do those unless there's some special reason to do that. Questions? Let me clarify something about celestazole. Mm. You have a patient that doesn't walk, wheelchair bound, bed bound. Will you treat that patient with celestazole? No, absolutely not. Yeah, I think celestazole is a medicine that improves circulation by an unknown mechanism. And, and so all we know is that if they walk, ex try to walk and take celestazole, they'll do better. If they can't exercise, if they really are chair bound or, or not active, then there's not much benefit. The one uh, second thing to think about, though, is celestol has been shown in several randomized trials to have a beneficial effect for restenosis. So it might not be unreasonable if you're thinking about placing a lot of metal stint in somebody's femoral artery and you know that the risk of restenosis will be higher, that celestazole might sort of tip things in your favor. And if they're in the wheelchair and they're constipated, <laughs> you, two birds with one stone. How long do you keep your patients on Plavix, peripheral? That's a great question. So there is no evidence that Plavix is necessary in the periphery. The, all of the evidence for Plavix is in the coronary circulation, which is much smaller vessels than in the periphery. So <clears throat> I typically don't use Plavix for large arteries, like an iliac stent or a renal stent. I don't use Plavix at all. I use only aspirin. If I do a renal or an iliac and I have a dissection or I have poor flow or it's not perfect, then I don't mind to use Plavix to assist that patency, but I don't. If I'm working below the knee and coronary size vessels, then I treat those tibial, those two and a half millimeter vessels just like I treat a coronary, but not the big guys. The big guys probably don't need Plavix. Any other questions? You want to make a, a comment on carotid stents? <laughs> so you know I love the government. Are, are, you guys are revolutionaries up here, right? You don't like the government. <laughs> um, so. You know, the government, the only part of the body where the government says you, you, thou shalt not touch is a carotid. And why they pick that is political. It has nothing to do with medicine. So just like everywhere else in the body, evidence drives what we do. Referring doctors drive what we do. If it turns out that less invasive therapy for carotids is better than surgery, so be it, right? But not if the government won't pay. And so right now, we're really in a box. You get a patient who's had radiation therapy, got a wooden neck, there's no way to operate on this fella, and he's got an 80% stenosis, maybe had a TIA a couple of weeks ago. You think you can put a carotid stent in that guy? You can't. So the, they've just complete, there now are people who are stuck. And now you're saying to an 85-year-old person, if you can come up with $25,000, I can fix your carotid tomorrow with a carotid stent. And, and they, what they face is stroke, and elderly folks, fear nothing more than the loss of their independence with a large stroke. They're afraid the stroke won't kill them, right? That, that's their biggest fear. If they have a stroke, they want it to take them. But we, we've got this mess going on in this country, and it's really, when doctors fight, which we are, the surgeons obviously are fighting us about this, when doctors fight, the government just stands on the sideline and says, you guys figured out, come back to us in a year. And the surgeons aren't letting this happen. So. The patients are really caught in the middle, and there really is, we are, sometimes we're our own, I know you don't believe this listening to me, but sometimes interventionists are our own worst enemy. Sometimes we're seen as cowboys, sometimes we're seen as too aggressive, sometimes we're seen as doing things without evidence. And so we don't have all the credibility that we could take to this argument because of that, and it doesn't take long for a surgeon to point that out. So 
patients get caught in the middle of these arguments, and I don't know, I don't know what the solution is. So it's a, it saddens me. It's a bad, difficult way to practice. Because it's it's great for for patients. Carotid stenting. Carotid stenting if if you have a chance, if you have the choice, you should be able to sit with your physician and have a discussion about the pros and cons, just like you would for an iliac stent. Do I want an iliac stent? Do I want an aortofemoral bypass? I mean, you know, you should be able to have that conversation, but today you cannot have that conversation about your carotid. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. White. I really appreciate you coming. Oh, thank you, man. Appreciate you. I want to take a picture. Oh, okay.